it's going to be a problem. So I'm going to we, we didn't collaborate very well. Well, we didn't collaborate at all, to be honest, on um, this presentation. So a lot of what I've, I'm covering, Nico also alluded to or talked to uh, to some extent. So a bit of repetition. Apologise for that. But uh, I'm looking almost exclusively at the uh, effects on generators themselves, large generators. To me, a large generator used to be 600 megawatts and above since I left ESCOM two years ago. Anything from three megawatts, one megawatt upwards is now a large generator. So the guys, the, the low those and them, uh, they have a five megawatt generator. It's really important, as important as a 600 megawatt machine might be to ESCOM. So it, the, uh, the grid code affects them as much as it does the ESCOM machines. Their machines might not affect the grid as much as the ESCO machines do, though. Just so first, for those of you who don't operate generators, um, can the network really affect my generator? If I plug it into the grid, is it really going to have an effect? Well, this is a 200 megawatt machine that, uh, okay, to be fair, it was a, it was a switch on fault, fob, um, but it absolutely cooked. You can see the, uh, this is the, the landing area, sorry, the landing area, which just melted, and this is the core retaining ring. That's molten steel which is dribbled into uh, the landing area. So that's that's the toughest steel you can get. And that's pretty from a, a system fault that this, uh, this occurred. This is a 60 megawatt machine from ongoing negative sequence clearance operations, so uh, balanced uh, network conditions. And you can see this is one of the, the wedges which took the you can see it's actually popping out the, uh, the slot there. So yes, the network can affect your machine. I'm going to be looking through these uh, implications from the grid code. The, wider range of frequency variations, the faster rate of change of frequency, uh, wider range of voltage variations, increased reactive power capability, uh, increased fault ride through capability or requirements, and um, increased excitation voltage ceiling factor. And uh, just have a look at a couple of other factors as well. Starting with that frequency variation, widening the requirements uh, for the frequency under and over frequency uh, of these machines. This is from the, uh, the IEC 34-1 and 3, these are the limits according to that. So continuous operation in frequency terms of plus and minus 2%. And above that, it says limited duration and reduced power. And from this is kind of a, a summary of what Nico was putting up there as well. And some of these requirements, and this is in, in the UK at the moment, go above that already. And uh, I'm talking about revising those, it's going to have implications. And what are those implications? Well, over frequency on the generation, on the generator itself, um, well, that, that come from excess generation. The modern governors should be able to pick that up fairly quickly, react to that fairly quickly. It's under frequency that we're going to have problems with uh, so on the network side. And that's an insufficient uh, capacity problem or a system overload problem. So it's likely with, with the issues in South Africa, that, that's more likely to happen. And in terms of the generator, um, that's our real problem. So over frequency, not too much an issue. Under frequency, as uh, Nick had talked about, when you're looking at under frequency, you're looking at the volts per hertz ratio, so volts per frequency ratio. That is effectively your magnetic flux density in the machine, B, is affected by the volts per hertz. The higher, so the, the lower the frequency, the higher that gets, the higher the magnetic flux density. These machines will be able to handle it depending on the kind of uh, materials that are used. So that the, the core material, the emanation material, what it's, what it's made of, how it's rolled, if it's got silicon in or not, all that sort of stuff. Uh, will, and its dimensions in particular, the size of the laminations, the core back depth, all that sort of stuff, um, will determine how this machine responds to that increased magnetic flux density. Uh, and they all be designed for a certain range. And if you go above that range, the, the flux effectively spills over, kind of gets out of the core, gets into the key bars which hold the machine together at the back, gets into the, uh, the press plate which hold the machine together at the ends. That results in circulating currents there and excess heat. So you see here's oh, sorry, uh, this one here. So this is the back of the core area. You can see that's a key bar between, sorry, between the press plate and the core, circulating currents and a lot of heat. That's impacting on the insulation, uh, the lamination insulation, resulting in this kind of thing. So this is not one of ours, fortunately, but this is a voltage incident in America. We can see that whole core is effectively melted. The turbine, however, is another problem. So both under and over frequency events will affect the turbine. Um, when I design these things, each blade row has a certain uh, natural frequency. It's designed, obviously, so that at greater speed, 
those the, the natural frequency isn't uh, excited. As soon as you go outside of its design frequency, design speed, you start running the risk of the turbine operating uh, in, in the kind of frequencies that are going to excite its natural frequencies. What you have then is the, the turbine the longer ones, the LP outers, they're going to start waving. You won't be able to see it, but effectively they, they start flapping around and uh, we, we get effectively fatigue damage um, and eventual failure. In other words, the blades that go and uh, you have a, a disaster on your turbine. So this is not to be taken lightly. Um, this is a study which done in the 90s, but that does affect the ESCO machines as, as most of them are, uh, you know, to pre-1994. They're showing that this is the the, natural, the the normal rate of frequency machine. As soon as you go away, more than one percent minus or plus over an under frequency, you start getting into the potential to cause damage. And certainly at two percent, which is fine for the generator, it's rated for two percent. The turbine starts to become problematic at that level. And that's something I'm not sure how much the uh, turbine guys are, are involved in this discussion. When we talk about the, you know, the grid code discussions with the generator guys, the electrical guys, the distribution networks. Are you talking to the turbine people as well? Um, this is from that same study, continuous operation in this mode here. And that's only just over one or just under one percent either way. When you look at the what the grid code is looking at, it's six percent, I think it was. Down here somewhere, you can only operate like that for a second or so until you start having problems in the turbine. And these guys are talking in 20 seconds or, or up to, to minutes, I think. Potential problems there. Moving on to the rate of change of frequency. Well, the generator, one of the issues might be that uh, you change too fast. If the system frequency is changing too fast, the generator can't keep up with that. The, the synchronous ability of the generator to, to maintain synchronicity can't keep up. Likelihood of pulse slipping. Not good potential tripping out of the generator itself or the auxiliaries. And you lose a big machine and then you, you start having problems coming onto, uh, onto the grid. The other thing though, what we're probably more concerned with long term damage is you're putting portional stress on the shaft. As you're trying to, to ramp up and down the frequency, increasing and decreasing speed, you're effectively twisting the shaft. Now, you know, a big turbine shaft, turbine generator shaft, uh, what are they, 40, 50 meters on these big machines, totally end to end. So nice and stiff in one plane, but in, in terms of twisting the resistance, not, not that good. So you put torsional stresses on by rapidly changing frequency, potential to cause uh, long term fatigue damage. The other issue, of course, is on the generator, you've got a damaged circuit designed to handle negative sequence currents to, to so main thing, surface currents in the rotor. But it's also there to keep the machine synchronized. If it goes out of synchronicity, you, you get um, like a, a little cage uh, of an induction motor. It uses currents in the damper circuit to speed it up or slow it down. Now you're rapidly changing frequency, you're going to be inducing currents in this damper circuit at that time. Is it designed for it? If it's not, you're going to have problems. And this is a case where you've got a damper circuit which actually melted and severe arc damage onto a core retaining ring, which had to be thrown away. Um, on the turbine again, you've got issues, torsional stresses, same sort of problem. Uh, you're going to have vibrations, fatigue failure of blades in the long term. Um, the other thing, of course, which we, we mustn't forget is the balance of the plant. You've got uh, all these auxiliaries sitting there, and the motors driving your cooling oil pump, your pumps, cooling water pumps, your uh, fans, the uh, FD fans. All of those are connected to the spread. If they can't handle these, these, these issues and they trip, the plant comes down as well. A little motor, if that goes down, it can bring the plant down with it. Um, looking at change, uh, a wider range of voltage variations so over and under voltages now. Um, under voltage, not too much of a problem to the generator physically, but in terms of operating it, if you're operating in the lagging, sorry, the leading power factor area, so this side of the curve, this is exporting bars, importing bars. Uh, there's something called the core end heating limit on, on generators, the core end heating effect, which is axial flux impinging on the end of the core, uh, which creates excess heat at the end of the core. If uh, the, 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 that heating effect is a, a function of your rotor excitation, it turns out that the, the worst case scenario is in the leading power factor range. And actually, there's a nice little curve that drops down, and when you're lagging power factor uh, operation mode, you're actually heating your core the least. Um, but in leading power factor, that's when it's a concern. 
I mean, that's so that, that's a case of your growth excitation voltages. And um, when you're decreasing the excitation voltage here, depending on what your voltage is, if you're under voltage, you can't go as far to, to the left of this curve. So as your stability limit changes, that means you can, you, you can import less VAS. Your ability to absorb VAS from the system changes if you're operating at an under voltage uh, area. Um, from the IEEE to us, the IEC 34.3, is one of the implications which Nico looked at was, uh, this curve kind of summarizes it. When you're looking at over voltage, it's plus and minus 5%, but you have to take that frequency to account. So when you're at an over frequency situation, that 2% over frequency here, then it's not a problem at all. As soon as you go under frequency, because of that volts per hertz, Either you, if you're too much volts and too little hertz, you, you're basically putting a whole bunch of flux density in there which you don't want. So as you go into this under frequency situation, the maximum voltage that IEC allows decreases. To the point where if you're at 2% under frequency, you can only allow 3% over voltage before the machine starts having problems. And this is not taken into account in the, the grid codes, I don't think. The other thing, obviously, with over voltage is you're stressing your installation more. Um, which is also not good for it long term. In terms of increased reactive uh, reactive power capability, well, on the new generators, in order to handle that, they're just going to have to be bigger, hence more expensive. Existing ones, well, you can increase your reactive loading, but that, to do so, you might have to sacrifice your active power. So from a, a standard capability diagram, yeah. and so this is the uh, importing bars, exporting bars, this is your rated full load uh, operating limit. Uh, it's, it's based on the turbine limit. Obviously, a generator can't produce more megawatts than the, uh, the turbine can produce. Uh, if you're operating at rated power factor here, at uh, your, your maximum active power, and someone asks you to go from uh, 0.4 per unit megawatts to exporting up to, say, 0.7 per unit megawatts, you can do it, but in order to comply with the, the heat limit on the rotor, you're going to have to start decreasing power along this curve. So by the time you get to 0.7, you're setting at 0.5% of uh, 0.5 Q of your um, active power. So you're going to have to drop power by 50% in order to reduce the, the megawatts that are required. But you can do it. Increased fault right through capability. Well, um, a number of machines that currently meet the standards will not necessarily be able to comply with uh, these new uh, low voltage right through requirements. Um, and certainly, if, if the system inertia is not enough, and you get an extended dip, either in terms of the, the voltage, the size of the voltage dip, or the duration of it, then machines are going to start tripping. And the moment they do, then you'll, you'll, the problem becomes worse. So you end up with the whole network just collapsing if, if the machines aren't <coughs> compliant or aren't able to withstand it. Um, the new machines, there's not much you can do with the old machines, um, existing machines. New machines, they're going to have to have higher inertia. Uh, Big, higher short circuit ratios, increased heating voltage factors and reactances. So in other words, once again, bigger, more expensive machines to do the same thing that uh, was done in the past. Just an example to look at increased short circuit ratios. So that's the stability of the, the generator or ability to, to, uh, to handle faults and things. If you, two ways of looking at it, you can either have a, a bigger machine with a higher output range or you can have a bigger air gap. Both cases, in terms of the weight of the main parts, bigger machines to, to cope with the going from a 0.5 to 0.8 uh, short circuit ratio, you're looking at 35% increase in the weight of the main parts for the one case and 17% for the other, both with huge cost implications. Um, something else is which we don't necessarily think about, and it's possibly more a problem with smaller machines, older machines, is that uh, what generally trips from full load, load rejection. If your protection, et cetera, is not properly set up, the turbine can overspeed. We've seen that on, on a lot of cases um, with the non ESCOM customers. I'm not sure about the ESCOM side. Um, and what happens, obviously, if you overspeed, um, puts extra stress on, and then it cuts down. So every time you're doing that, you're stressing the generator and the turbine more than it's, it, it wants to. It can handle it a few times, but if you keep doing it, it's, uh, it's going to be a problem, long term problem. Increasing the uh, excitation voltage seeding factor. Um, so, like I mentioned, currently we're looking at 1.6 per unit as the, the maximum. Now, they say, well, let's push that to three, uh, so, yeah, three per unit. So, this is the, a rotor um, 
we're looking inside a rotor, we're looking at the, the slot liners, and we're looking at the turn insulation between the turns here. These already have a heck of a tough time from uh, the mechanical stresses on them, psychic stresses. Every time you run the thing up, run it down again, you, you're putting stress on this thing. Uh, if you have static excitation systems, you already got from the rectified bridges, you've got these high, high frequency pulses, which are coming along, spikes coming along and stressing that insulation. Now you want to over add another layer on top of that, more voltage when you have the ceiling factor when you need it. Um, more stress and premature failure once again. New machines to design that out, you're going to have to have more robust insulation systems. If you want the same slot size to have more insulation in there, you've got to have less copper. So they're going to run hotter or you build a bigger machine. In both cases, expense. Total harmonic distortion factor. Well, one of the problems, so anything which, any harmonic on the network which isn't uh, synchronized to the rotor is going to cause surface currents in the rotor. So once again, if you, you're already sitting with a, a negative sequence capability of, I think, so it's 8% outside is the same in S-bomb, 8% negative sequence capability. But it's saying it's fine, you can handle 8% negative sequence capability, but if you've got a machine which is sitting close to that, and you throw in harmonic distortion on top of that, suddenly it goes beyond that. Now you've got overheating rotors, damper circuits, which are having problems in arcing. So we, we need to be careful both with harmonics. Um, and uh, I was going to say there, so on the existing rotors, in order to cope with that, probably you're going to have to deload, which is the last thing we want to do with certain conditions. New rotors are going to have to modify the damp circuit, um, or you're going to have to rate the machine higher to cope with gain expense. Rapid reclosing of breakers onto faults, um, whether it's delayed or rapid, it's going to affect the chain. Mechanical torque stresses on the shaft, that sort of stuff. Um, higher forces on the end windings. And either way, to cope with that, if you want to assist the machine to handle that, you have to build in bigger, uh, more inertia, possibly a flywheel onto it, stiffen up the design again costs. Um, one th I've mentioned already, but we mustn't forget the auxiliaries. These are also connected. Any issues with the, the grid has to be uh, handled by the auxiliaries. If they can cope, if they fail, then your machine can go out. I think I was talking about uh, there been a number of trips in SCOM where the under voltage conditions causing your overcurrent protection to come in, and the contact is falling out, and then you, you lose those machines, and they've had multiple unit trips as well as a result. And something not, not entirely heard related, but kind of more around the, um, the, the renewables coming in, is, and what Pierre was talking to about, is if we take the base load machines and make them uh, double sh uh, two shifting, there are huge implications, and we've seen that in ESCOM already when um, we started two shifting the uh, Duvers to Tukas and Manlock. Within a fairly short space of time, we ended up having to rewind a ton of those rotors. One of the problems is, is when you borrow a machine, it actually has a lot more stress than you'd have imagined in terms of inter-turn insulation. So it's called copper dusting. We're ending up having to implement uh, rectification for that. But either way, every time you start or stop a generator, the Talk, OEMs talk about roughly a 30 equivalent operating hours for every start or stop. Some even go as high as saying 45 operating hours per, uh, per start or stop. If you look at that, if you two shifting regularly today, then in a year, you're looking at about 300 start starts. That's about 9,000 equivalent operating hours per year. It's only 8,000 operating hours a year, so you're basically halving the life of the generator by, by two shifting. And that's apart from the fact that every time you run it up and down, there's this huge thermal, uh, cyclic and thermal stresses on the rotor insulation and on um, the stator insulation. As you as you heat the thing up, copper expands and it's sheer stress on insulation. Tear away, uh, you end up with this boiling and, and discharging or partial discharges coming up. So it's, it's really not a good thing to do. But just uh, just briefly an example from the South Australian network. We we did some work for them on um, synchronous condensers. Their grid conditions. So they shut down a lot of their coal-fired stations uh, over the past few years, and they're running mainly on, on wind and solar. I think that they, weeks ago, they 54% of their generation capacity was from rooftop uh, PV. But they've got a really really unstable grid. They've managed to tip the whole network at least once, if not twice, uh, over the last couple of years. So they're busy trying to work around that. They have to put in about 600 MVA of um, synchronous condensers to, to cope with that, to make it more stable. 
and the, the requirement for the simplest condenser which they've asked us to, to source is this thing was handled between 47 to 49 hertz so 47 hertz the bottom range there for up to two minutes rate of change a frequency of three hertz per second and uh, up to 1.3 overvolt very quick time but that's the kind of thing these are going to handle and this is because of that is what the grid is seeing it's not a nice to have this is what the grid conditions are in south australia at the moment so uh, if we go that way, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. In conclusion, um, yeah, changing the grid codes is going to have significant impact on generators design and performance. Um, generator and turbine standards have to evolve in parallel. But if, but if you do this, you're going to have more complicated and more expensive machines. Um, existing plant, it's not so easy. And this is something which is yeah, certainly a concern for the, the guys who've got embedded generation. I'm not sure how the grid code requirements affect them so much. I know, you know if you connect a 60 megawatt into the grid, you, it's got to comply. Um, so they, there's a lot of machines out there uh, owned by the SAPIs and the Lovos and Sassels and, and all that who aren't ESCO machines. There's a, there's a ton of them. And they've all got to comply with this. But some of these machines have been running for 30, 40 years. Now suddenly they have to meet these new requirements and they just can't do it. But if you're a, a sugar mill, do you want to go and spend whatever 40, 50 million on a new generator or 100 million on a new generator just to meet the new grid code requirements? Possibly part of the discussion uh, side of things. Um, so in order to meet them, you're going to have to either modify the plant significantly or buy a new one. So uh, compilers of standards for grid codes and machines, so generators, turbines, and motors. We mustn't forget motors as well. You guys in particular, that's, uh, that's an important aspect. They also are going to have to uh, suffer through what the, what the grid code, what the grid does. And they need to keep talking. If they don't, if it's not done sensibly, it's going to be great news for repair companies and results not need to be just busy. So uh, I, I just want to also say, I have no problem with renewable energy. I think it's, it's fantastic, but it needs to be implemented sensibly and it, we really need to think about how we do it.